Diagnosing a key off battery draw or parasitic drain used to be relatively simple. There were common causes like trunk light or glove box lights that wouldn't turn off or cigarette lighter elements that had failed and continued to heat up even after the key was removed. You know, we take the negative battery cable loose and wire a test light in the series and if the light glowed we knew that something was on that shouldn't be. Then it was simply a matter of pulling the fuses until the light went out and that would identify the circuit that had the problem. Today, parasitic draw is a little more elusive and a little more complex. And finding the cause is the subject of this edition of The Trainer. Now that old test light took about 500 milliamps to light up. That's about 10 times more than the generally accepted spec for parasitic drain of 30 to 50 milliamps. Why? <laughs> Blame the electronics. Now there are literally dozens of electronic control modules on a modern car and they run everything from the engine and transmission to the headlights and radio. Of course while the car is running that's not a problem. They're all powered up and working. But when you turn the key off, many of these modules will continue to function for some time afterwards, maybe a few minutes to as long as eight hours, depending on the manufacturer. We call these modules awake or still online, and that's normal, it's expected. But when the problem comes up on looking for parasitic draw is when one of these modules decides that it's not going to power down or go to sleep, but remain awake, remain drawing power in excess of what that specification that we gave you earlier is. And that can lead to problems with the key off drain. Now, using that old conventional method of taking the negative battery cable loose and then putting a light or ammeter in series could actually mask the problem by causing the module that's staying awake to reset and not be awake when we go to make our tests. So we need to find a way to test for parasitic drain or key off battery draw in a way that fools the system into thinking that the battery is still where it's supposed to be or doesn't affect or open the circuit in any way. Let's take a look at one way to do that. The first method I'm going to show you uses just the multimeter, specifically the ammeter function that's built into your multimeter. Nearly every tech I know has at least this tool in their toolbox, and we can use this to do a very accurate, very precise parasitic draw test. The key, though, is to make sure that we, again, fool the system into thinking that the battery is connected while we disconnect the battery to put our meter in, in series. And this is uh, one way we can do that. What we're going to do is use a jumper box as our temporary power source. We're going to take the positive lead and connect it to our positive post on the battery. And we're going to take the negative lead and connect it to the negative cable itself. Now with that hooked up and going, I can loosen up the cable and carefully remove it, making sure I keep that electrical contact. Right now, the system thinks it's still got the battery installed. Actually, it's being powered by the jump pack. The module isn't going to reset, and this allows me to put my meter in series so that I can perform my test. Now, before we put our meter in series, let's go over the meter itself. Right now, I have the meter leads inserted in the black common or ground side and in the voltage position, but I'm not measuring voltage. So step number one is to make sure that we place this red lead into the amps function. In this case, the one labeled 15 amps. I'm always going to start on the highest possible scale. I don't know how much, if any, current draw there is. So I'm going to make sure I do everything to protect my meter and, uh, and go to the 15 amp side first. Not a bad idea to even include a, a fused jumper wire so that you can put the fuse jumper wire between the battery post and your meter lead uh, in case there's a problem is drawing too much current. The meter will blow, not your meter. Uh, if you don't move the meter leads where they're supposed to be and you start pumping current through it, you're going to see smoke and you're not going to like where it's coming from. So be sure you set the meter up properly before you connect it in series. Of course, we have to change the scale. So we're going to move the knob to the 15 amp scale and then we're going to put it in series with the battery and see what we got. Okay, once I have my meter in place, I've got the negative meter lead on the negative post and the positive meter lead on the cable itself. I can go ahead and remove the jump box lead very carefully. And now I'll be reading the key off drain. If you can quite see it from the angle there, 
but I'm reading 0.78 amps, not quite an amp. So we've got a problem, we have a battery drain. Okay, just to recap very quickly. I need to fool the system into thinking that the battery is still in the system, that I didn't open the system in order to get my meter in series with the battery cable. And I did this in this case with the jump box. The positive lead goes to the positive battery post, the negative lead to the negative cable. Then I can remove the cable with that jump lead attached to it. The car is going to think that the battery is still in the car. I can put my meter in series between the post and the cable, remove the jump lead, and go ahead and measure draw. What are some alternative methods? You can use a host battery or a second battery if you want instead of a jump box. There are also connectors that allow you to plug your uh, jump box directly into the diagnostic link connector. That's the place where you hook your scan tool. That will keep everything alive there as well. What you can't do is use the old 9 volt battery in the cigarette lighter trick. Doesn't work on OBD2 cars, isn't going to keep the modules powered up, and as soon as you open the door, you're going to drain that 9 volt battery down to nothing. So forget that idea. Jump box, host battery, or directly to the DLC with the appropriate connector. Those are the three ways that you can do that and get your meter wired in series. Our next method is going to continue to use your multimeter, but now we're going to add another tool to it. It's called a low amp clamp. If you don't have one of these in your toolbox, not a bad investment. It's a very valuable diagnostic tool. It can be used to check for parasitic drain as well. The beauty of the amp clamp is that it goes around the wire that you're trying to measure current flow in. You don't have to put it in series like you do the ammeter in your multimeter. Okay, first a couple of tool notes. Whether your low amp clamp is designed to work with a multimeter or scope, or it's a standalone unit, it works the same way. You clamp it around the conductor in which you want to measure the current. Now, when you pass current through a conductor, of course, there's an electromagnetic field that's generated. That's what the tool picks up on and converts into a voltage reading that your meter or your scope can understand. So you want to make sure first that the batteries that power this unit are in good shape and that when you do clamp around the connector or conductor rather, you come in and make sure the jaws are completely closed or you won't get an accurate reading. Now since we are taking a voltage reading that we're going to convert to an amperage one, we're going to put the meter leads into the same jacks as we would our voltmeter leads. Very important guys, when you're using the ammeter function in your meter, you've got to use the amp jacks. And if you're gonna use the clamp, you've gotta use the voltage jacks. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and measure the current flow. I've got my meter set to voltage scale. I've got the meter leaves in the correct place. The meter's turned on. Now I'm gonna turn the clamp on. I've got a nice green light telling me that the battery's healthy and it's ready to go. Then I'm gonna zero. Then we're going to go to a very accessible point and measure the current flow. Okay, really not get anything on the scale. Let's switch it down to millivolts. Okay, we're reading 25.8 millivolts. Okay, if you look carefully at the scale here, one millivolt is equal to 10 milliamps. So I'm reading 250 milliamps of current draw, about a quarter of an amp. Well, that's not quite the three quarters of an amp that I read with my meter, is it? Okay, why the discrepancy? When we measure current flow directly, we read almost eight tenths of an amp coming out of the battery. When we measured it with the amp clamp on the negative battery cable, we only drew about a quarter of an amp. That's a significant difference. I think there's a few factors. How about a stack up of tolerances? In other words, on my meter, how accurate is that really at measuring voltages that small? And the amp clamp, how accurate is it measuring current that small? How about when you put the two together? You think there might be some room for error? You know, I don't know the technical reasons or why, but I do know that it's not accurate and it's a pr process that I'd rather not use when I'm testing for parasitic drain. Let me show you a way though that you can. Okay, this is gonna use the same method as I just showed you with the amp clamp, but we're gonna make our own little attachment. We still have to open it up and uh, wire something in series. And what I've done is I've taken the loop of wire and I've looped it around. I have five loops of wire. And let's just think for a minute. If I'm drawing eight tenths of an amp through one wire, and now I'm reading it through five, what do you think my amp meter is gonna tell me? Oh, if you said four amps, pretty good guess. Let's see how well it works on the car. Well, there you go. If you can see the meter reading, it's reading 0.49 volts. If we apply the 
one millivolt equals 10 milliamp correction, we're reading 4.9 amps of current draw. But I'm reading it through five loops of wire. So 4.9 divided by five, roughly five, am uh, five amps divided by five, that's about an amp. Okay, that puts us right up at the eight tenths that we measured earlier, doesn't it? Okay, let's a quick recap on using the amp clamp. Now the amp clamp is a great tool and it's, it's a very valuable diagnostic tool and a lot of different electrical troubleshooting techniques. However, in my personal opinion, I don't think this is one of them. At least not non-intrusive testing where we can just clamp around the negative battery cable and get a reading. Where there's the stack of tolerances or other factors, the reading just isn't accurate and if I'm looking for a drain in the, in the low hundreds or, or less milliamp range, I'm not going to be confident I'm getting good test results. What I can do is similar to what I did with the meter itself. And I can go in series with the battery cable using the same techniques you shared at the beginning of the video. And instead of wiring in the meter, I'm gonna wire in the specially made loop. Now all I'm doing is using a multiplication factor. I know that if I have a tenth of an amp running in one lead that's running five times, that's five times the current reading that the amp clamp has the capability of picking up. Or in other words, 0.5 amps is up measure. Now, of course, I have to apply that correction factor when I'm wondering how much current draw I'm dealing with, but it does make it easier for the amp clamp to see and for your meter to read. Now, there is a third method I want to share with you, one that is not intrusive, doesn't require you to open anything up, and is just as accurate, if not more accurate, than the test we've seen so far. It uses voltage drop. Now, if you've been following along with motor range for any length of time, you know that we're a big believer in voltage drop testing techniques. We have a lot of resources in our community and our YouTube site on that very subject. But very quickly to define, voltage drop is the drop of voltage across the resistance. That's normal. That's supposed to happen. Voltage is used to overcome the resistance. So once all that resistance is overcome, voltage is no longer needed. Now, can you think of something on the car that we might be able to test that will provide us an indication of whether current is flowing non-intrusively using voltage drop? Well, how about the fuses? Aren't they a resistor? Yeah, not much, granted, not much, but they are a resistor. So if I go through checking the fuses one at a time and I measure voltage drop across them, I found where current is flowing and I've done it non-intrusively. Okay, what we're gonna do is access the main fuse panel and you can find this in your service information system uh, see what powers what. It's called a power distribution diagram. You're going to need that later to isolate where the uh, circuit problem lies anyway. So might as well go ahead and get that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure across the fuses as I described. Let me show you. So I just pull one out here. We'll take a look. See if I can show that to you. Get that centered and let it focus. See those two little metal nibs? Both the mini and maxi fuses have them. And I'm going to place my meter leads one on one, one on the other using the millivolt scale, because it's not going to be much, and look for a reading. If I measure voltage drop across this fuse, well, the only way that can happen is if current's flowing. So that's going to tell me what circuit's awake and which ones aren't. Let's try it out. Okay, I got some really pointy ends here on my meter leads. I'm going to set it on the millivolt scale and turn it on. And the lead's going to bounce a little bit, not too concerned about that. And then I'm going to start checking fuses. I tell you, let's start up here. I'm going to get in here where you can see it. Again, one on one of the little metal tabs and one on the other. And we'll get a reading of zero. Move to the next. Zero. And I mean a perfect zero. That means no current is flowing in that fuse. Okay. Is zero. And yes, you have to be right on the fuse. Need a good meter. There's zero. Whoa, there's 3.2. Okay, let's, uh, let's try that one more time so you can get a little closer look and see you know, what I'm doing here. Okay, I'm measuring the voltage drop across the fuse. Meter lead right on the little metal tab on one side. Then on the other, zero. A little more tab on one side. Then on the other, zero. A little metal tab on one side. Then on the other, 3.3. .3. There's a voltage drop, small, it's only 3.3 .3 millivolts, 
but it means that current is flowing through this fuse. So whatever circuit this fuse is sending power to, that's where I need to focus my attention on. And again, did it not intrusively. I didn't have to open any circuits. I didn't have to interrupt power to any of the modules. So whatever's causing the problem is still there, easy to find. Now it's a matter of just tracing down exactly where the problem lies. Okay, I've shown you three different ways that you can use to measure parasitic drain, all with a fair amount of accuracy. The first two methods, the meter itself and the meter with a low amp clamp, require that you open the system in order to get your meter leads placed. Uh, of course, I've shown you a couple of ways that you could fool the system into thinking the battery is left alone. That way you could keep the modules that might be staying awake when they shouldn't, you can keep them powered up and, and have a much better chance at finding them. Even though you, you know how to do these now, we're still stuck at the battery. We only know that there's a drain coming out of the battery. Now we have to isolate exactly where it's coming. And for that, you're gonna need a power distribution diagram. If you're using one of the first two methods, all you know is that there's current leaving the battery between the battery post and the battery cable. When we look at the diagram though, we see that that very quickly branches off into two legs, like two branches on a river. Now, if I go to those two legs and I place my meter or my low amp clamp, do you think one of those will read current flow and the other will not? Of course. And the one that does read current flow, well, that's the channel that I'm taking. That's the leg of the river that I'm taking. And I'm gonna keep following that river downstream using my power distribution schematic as a guide until I find that one leg, that one branch where current's flowing. That's where my problem's gonna lie. The beauty with the voltage drop method, though, is I very quickly isolated to one particular fuse, didn't I? Now I can look at the power distribution diagram. I've eliminated a whole lot of river really quick. This particular one is the dome fuse. That feeds the dome light, uh, the glove box light, and a few other interior lights. So now I only have a few things to look at. If there's a fuse downstream from the one that I measured voltage drop on, I can go to that one and see if I still have voltage drop further isolating the legs of the stream that I need to focus on. You continue that process logically and step by step using your power distribution diagram as a guide to finally isolate the component that's at fault. Sometimes when you get to that particular one, simply unplugging it will confirm the fact that the component is bad. The current will go away. Well, thanks for watching. I appreciate you hanging out with us on this edition of The Trainer. I'll see you next month.